the priorities that we have for the program, whether they are well adapted, whether there are any gaps. And uh, we also invite you to, to provide uh, input, to ask questions, and to try to make this um, session as interactive as possible. Uh, there is a Slido uh, for the people online, but also to, to anyone here who prefers to use that, uh, which you can use to, to ask questions to us and to, to, the, to the presenters. So please feel free to, to interact as much as possible. Uh, and without any further delay, I can uh, introduce the first uh, speaker who will be joining online. It's uh, Konstantin Tarasov from SEA, who, who will be presenting Project Sherlock, uh, which is dealing with uh, liquid, liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Konstantin, welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, just, okay, I cannot see my slides, uh, so I think uh, somebody can... Uh, uh, list them, turn off, uh, turn on. So uh, I'm presenting um, my project, our project is called Sherlock. It's about sustainable and cost efficient catalysts for hydrogen and energy storage application based on liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Uh, this project uh, is uh, kindly supported by uh, European Union on the level of uh, about uh, two and a half million euros. And so the project was started in January uh, uh, 2021. So it lasts for three years. And uh, we've got uh, different partners from academic institutions like uh, CEA, where I work in France, um, FAU University from uh, Nuremberg in Germany, uh, Bilbao University uh, from Spain, and also uh, industrial partners uh, like uh, Halogenius and Evonik uh, from Germany, uh, KPRT company from Netherlands, and um, academic partner uh, outside of Europe from South Africa, uh, Northwest University. So uh, our project concerns um, hydrogen and transportation and storage. And so the technology, LHC, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carrier, uh, is uh, based on the utilization of pair of liquid organic molecules. Uh, when one molecule is uh, lean um, in hydrogen, another one is rich in hydrogen, and uh, both uh, molecules can be converted uh, into each other by catalytic hydrogenation or dehydrogenation uh, reactions. Um, so, uh, as uh, next slide, please, uh, number number four. Um, LHC um, technology has, as other technologies, has advantages and drawbacks. About uh, talking about advantages, I would uh, like to mention that uh, this technology is uh, nicely compatible with existing infrastructure, infrastructure which exists on uh, petrochemical plants and all this equipment, because uh, uh, organic molecules are liquid and they have uh, about the same viscosity as uh, petrochemical products we are already using. Also. Uh, advance, one of the advantages is this uh, relatively this, uh, relative safety. Uh, it's uh, quite safe uh, molecules uh, about uh, chemical about uh, chemical impacts. Sorry, about Constantine. Sorry to interrupt you. I think we are uh, in a different slide from the one that you are. Yes, using. number number four, please. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I'm talking about advantages and drawbacks. So. Uh, um, one of the advantages I uh, mentioned is the compatibility with the existing infrastructure of uh, existing uh, petrochemical industry. Safety, say it's quite um, relatively safe for molecule. Uh, and also these molecules are able to absorb up to 7% uh, by mass of hydrogen. So it's a, it's a good parameter. And also as these molecules are quite chemically stable, uh, this technology can be used for long-term uh, storage of hydrogen in this form. Of course, there are drawbacks, and the main drawbacks is the energy needed for uh, catalytic reaction, hydrogenation, and especially dehydrogenation reactions. 
Also, we need to use catalysts, and the most efficient catalyst is uh, usually is based on the platinum group metals, which are expensive. And also, uh, as it's a catalytic uh, process, uh, we uh, they require so very strict for our technology. The uh, selectivity should be very very high to be able to form uh, less possible byproducts and to be able to use many many cycles uh, of these molecules. So the main, object main objectives of our project is to develop new catalysts. Uh, is uh, low or no platinum uh, metals, which would be active in hydrogenation and dehydrogenation reactions. It is a good degree of conversion and a uh, very uh, good degree of selectivity. Also, one of the main objectives uh, is to develop uh, catalytic uh, structures um, with improved uh, thermal conductivity properties in order to avoid uh, creation of hotspots and, as a result, uh, production of uh, byproducts. And also, one of the objectives is to evaluate uh, scalability and um, environmental and economic availability of uh, LOHC technology. So, next slide, please, number five. Uh, talking about uh, our achievements to date, so we started in January 2021, so we have uh, a bit uh, more than uh, one year again, and maybe before the end. Uh, we've got uh, a quite uh, good results on obtaining of uh, catalysts for uh, hydrogenation. So we managed to obtain a catalyst without platinum which was quite well. I can, uh, can admit that if it add a little bit of uh, platinum, it works even better. Um, and we, we have good uh, results uh, concerning uh, conversion, which is even better than objective. And the selectivity is very, very close to the objective. So we need a little bit of improvement. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm talking about uh, dehydrogenation part, that's more challenging because this uh, uh, part uh, is, uh, needs more more development and results a bit more modest than uh, in case of uh, hydrogenation. Uh, uh, we obtained uh, quite interesting uh, systems based again uh, on platinum and uh, we admit that, uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, avoid uh, using uh, platinum group metals, uh, but we are lowering uh, the quantity of platinum needed for catalysts. Uh, we are working about uh, the content of 0.5%, uh, 0.3%, so, which is also is a good result. Um, we have quite uh, good kinetics, uh, especially initial kinetics, and uh, about conversion. We need some improvements. Uh, so we sometimes we are approaching uh, eighty percent, and uh, well, while we need a ninety percent conversion and selectivity. <clears throat> in some cases, we uh, it was we're not so far from objective, but we still ninety ninety eight percent. So it's not uh, it's not. Uh, satisfactory results yet, but uh, we, we hope to improve this parameter by the end of the, uh, of the project. But I also can admit that the uh, uh, substantial part of the project was uh, a DFT simulations to predict uh, interesting compositions where we try to apply. So we think that uh, utilization of bimetallic uh, systems uh, is uh, quite uh, a promising direction for developing a uh, catalyst for uh, the hydrogenation of uh, LOC molecules. And um, also uh, interesting results, which I uh, don't present on the slides, but just uh, describe orally. It's recreating our uh, architectures, uh, honeycomb um, structures, uh, we are printed uh, by 3D printing. Uh, they are based on uh, aluminium structures, honeycomb structures. So uh, we have some modelization we, to, to understand which um, structures more uh, promising uh, 
especially concerning um, uh, thermal conductivity properties. And now we are starting to test uh, these structures. So hope uh, it's going to give uh, good results. And also, um, quite nice advances are from testing uh, catalysts uh, in uh, mixtures of hydrogen with other molecules. Um, next slide, please. Um, well, the, what was asked to present, the risk charges are lessened a lot uh, during the project. I can admit that in the beginning, uh, of course, there were, there were some difficulties in uh, uh, coordination of uh, such a big project uh, with uh, partners from different countries, uh, with different uh, uh, research cultures. But now I think we found this uh, our optimum uh, Modes. Uh, the collaboration, I think, is, is, is going very well. Uh, interactions and coordination. So I think uh, we are improved here. And talking about technical problems, I should admit that uh, probably we uh, uh, we lost some time uh, in the beginning working only on powders, or, uh, catalyst uh, in the form of powders, rather than uh, now. Uh, when we need to test these catalysts at the uh, equipment uh, on the equipment of our industrial partners, we see that uh, it's not only quantities we bigger quantities we need, which so is a challenge for uh, laboratory level uh, equipment, but also we need to pellet it form. So, so we need to readapt uh, the preparation of our catalysts. So we losing a bit time. So unfortunately, uh, we didn't start. Um, uh, we didn't. Um, see this uh, potential problem uh, in the very beginning of the project. Well, and also uh, this slide uh, was asked to present is the exploitation and impact. I think it's a bit early to talk about this, but what is ensuring that uh, one of the uh, leaders in the, in the area are uh, heterogeneous as well as uh, Evonik, and KPRT uh, are in the project. So uh, we do hope they are going to use uh, our results and the uh, very interested what they're doing. And they collaborating very well as well. And about the um, general impact, well, uh, also it's a bit early to, to talk about this, but uh, we do hope that uh, the improvements we're going to do we're going to update uh, by the end of the project uh, will improve uh, the attractiveness uh, um, of our technology if we compare with other technologies uh, on hydrogen uh, storage and transportation. So that's what I wanted to present. I think, uh, well, I it was 10 minutes, not more, I guess. Yes. So, so your questions, please. Thank you, Constantine, for the presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to turn to the audience in case there are any, any questions at this point. Uh, and then maybe I could ask you a more general question, Constantine, uh, okay. with respect to the technology overall and how, how it compares to other hydrogen carriers that we that are, avail are available and are foreseen as possible solutions for the future. Could you tell us a bit uh, about the specific advantages of liquid organic hydrogen carriers and how, what are the ideal conditions for, uh, for them to compete in this uh, new market? Okay. Well, thank you uh, for this question. Um, uh, I just uh, I would like to again uh, mention that uh, at the moment there are three uh, technology uh, more or less developed for transportation and storage of hydrogen. It's the liquefied uh, hydrogen, uh, also the transportation of hydrogen in the form of uh, ammonia, and finally LHC. So, well, as usual, uh, all three have. Uh, advantages and drawbacks. And if um, 
Well, the advantages, again, I was mentioned, uh, if you talk about LHC, it's the most safe uh, uh, technology, um, less environmental impact, uh, less toxic, and chemically more stable, uh, and it allows more flexibility. About the uh, where it's uh, more competitive, uh, in what situation, in what scenarios, uh, if we compare this to uh, other technologies. I can mention that um, some, uh, some prediction, some calculation of uh, cost, uh, we, uh, can, you can look at the edition of uh, Roland uh, Berger, um, which was published recently. Uh, it shows that uh, LHC technology is more competitive um, in case uh, we need a long uh, distance transportation. For example, for a site uh, where the production of green hydrogen is uh, very interesting, where this uh, wind and solar energy costs uh, very, uh, very low, like for example in the Mid East, um, <coughs> Mid East countries, uh, North Africa or South Spain, for example, and where we need to transport um, uh, hydrogen uh, to more populated, more dense populated uh, of Western Europe. Uh, so here, uh, LC um, technology has, uh, as you know, as we talk about the uh, overall price, is uh, a bit more competitive. Also, um, we can say I can say that it um, can be more interesting where we looking for more flexibility. on the different options can uh, can be, uh, um, for example, uh, when the big boats uh, transported by sea arrived on the big harbor, so we can have option. We can store it there. We can. Um, take the hydrogen by dehydrogenation and inject it in the existing pipelines or also we can uh, charge uh, the organic molecules to smaller boats that are supported uh, um, either by rivers or on, on trucks uh, for smaller towns for, for the destination. So um, from this point of view, I think LHC technology uh, allows more flex flexibility and uh, so it uh, looks more interesting uh, if we compare this uh, to other existing technologies. Okay, thank you very much, Constantine. Uh, and I think now it's a good time to move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, it's from Project uh, Higgs, and we thank you. have. Thank you. We will have, um, yeah, Javier Sanchez Lineth, who will be presenting presenting to us the results that they have already uh, from. Hello, it sees now we move to, to pipelines. Javier, the floor is yours. So, uh, good morning to all of you. I'm Javier Sanchez from the Aragon Hydrogen Foundation. It is nice to see you here and greetings also to the people joining online. So, time to talk about hydrogen injection in the grid. Higgs is a project which is the answer to the call in 2019 asking for the systematic validation of the ability to inject hydrogen at different blend levels in high pressure grids. This is important, the term high pressure, because we are dealing with transport grids, right? It's a project that started in 2020 and should end uh, this year, but we've been granted one year extension, so in the end, it will end in uh, December 2023. It's a project we can say approximately 75% of it is implemented and has been fully funded by the Clean Hydrogen Partnership with a budget over 2 million euros. This is the picture of the people making it possible. We, the Aragon Hydrogen Foundation, are coordinating the project but have five more partners in the consortium. From Spain, our experts from Technalia in materials, the gas operators, Redexis, Eric in Belgium, dealing with all the dissemination and communication, DTGW in Germany, our experts in regulations, and finally, our people from East Switzerland, OST, who are dealing with the techno-economic modeling. 
Our goal in Higgs is uh, paving the way to decarbonize the gas grid. And to make this possible, what we are trying to know is filling all or most of the gaps of knowledge existing about the impact that high levels of hydrogen can have on the infrastructure. Higgs is based in three pillars of action. First of all, the mapping of technical, legal, and regulatory barriers and enables. This means we are doing a review of the state of art of how the gas grid, the trans uh, transport gas grid is composed and the regulation and legal framework that currently exists. Secondly, uh, the second pillar is testing and validation of systems and innovation. This means we have built a specific uh, testing platform that replicates a gas grid. And in this platform, we are installing actual components of the grid that uh, those we have identified as the most uh, representative, and we expose them to different hydrogen levels from blend to pure hydrogen to see if they are compatible or not. And finally, we also want to develop a techno-economic model to see what is the cost and effort to repurpose transport grids uh, to hydrogen transport. In the end, we want to define a set of conclusions that can aim as pathway towards enabling uh, the hydrogen injection in high pressure grids. Some of the results we have so far uh, are shown in the following slides. Regarding the experimental campaign in our testing platform, we are considering four different conditions which are based on four different hydrogen levels. First of all, a blend of 20% hydrogen in methane. Then we move to the same blend, but incorporating hydrogen sulfide and CO2 traces of these components as impurities in natural gas. Then we are going to raise the concentration to 30%, and we will finish testing our facility with uh, pure hydrogen, so 100%. Right now, we can say we are 60% completed. We are between uh, in the transition between the second and the third campaign, and we have our results early ready <laughs> for the second one. Um, we are running three kinds of tests in parallel in our uh, testing facility. First of all, we are checking the tightness of a uh, component. The results are those you see in these graphs. What we have done is uh, install several testing valves in lines that we fill uh, with gas up to 80 bar pressure with the blend, and we check the pressure drop and in gas composition during the time of the experiment spin of 3,000 hours. What we have seen is that there are no critical pressure losses, so basically the system remained tight, and the, gas, the hydrogen concentration in the blend uh, was almost constant, so um, seeing oscillations below 1% more. This means the maximum average liquids, uh, leakage, sorry, for each uh, valve would be one normal milliliter hour, so we can consider that for 20% hydrogen concentration, the system is tight. We are also checking uh, hydrogen sensitivity of the testing materials. So we are exposing mm, the most representative carbon steels of the transport, European transport grid to the plant and we are checking afterwards if some signs of embrittlement or other damage appear. We have shown, uh, we are testing this in form of a standard strain uh, specimens of uh, grades from AP5L, X42 to X70. We have uh, seen no cracks appearing on searing four-point bent specimens. Uh, no crack propagation either in pre-cracked CT bull specimens. So under the testing conditions, it's also necessary to be cautious, but under the, uh, the tested conditions, the uh, steel seems uh, compatible. We have not only tested uh, steels, but we have also checked with what happens with uh, equipment component. After the campaigns, we have disassembled uh, the pressure regulator, filter, and we have inspected the seals, membranes, all the different parts, and we have uh, seen no, uh, uh, no real signs of, of damage, at least because of hydrogen. We also consider in our empirical campaign um, 
gas separation issue. So what happens with, uh, with customers that wants to remain connected to the grid as end user when a blend uh, scenario happens and they, they, they cannot tolerate high amounts of hydrogen in the blend. We have performed some deblended blended tests with just one condition, 20% uh, hydrogen in methane, using a gas separation prototype. Uh, this uh, separation prototype is based on membrane technology. It contains palladium membranes. And what we have done is uh, feeding constantly this 20% blend at 80 bar to the prototype, separate the stream, and check uh, the composition of uh, uh, both of them. What we have seen, what you see in the graph, is the stream uh, with the recovered hydrogen. We get a constant flow, so the, the, the prototype works stable during the five hours operation of the test, and we get a high uh, hydrogen recovery, at least 96%. It's not high, really high purity, but it's first step uh, in the separation. Obviously, we have found several risks and challenges uh, during this uh, adventure, I can say. First of all, uh, the lack of information on the European grid. Some uh, TSOs have not been quite willing to collaborate, sharing their data, usually because of confidentiality issues, um, because they are dealing with similar projects. And we had trouble getting the picture uh, of the European grid, which has also had an impact on our uh, simulation, our technoeconomic model, uh, because we had to make some simplifications in it to, to get accurate uh, results. And uh, yeah, some difficulties also regarding to uh, the lack of a, standard, a standardized method uh, for it. We had also some trouble uh, because of the delay in the assembly of our testing facility. Uh, this has made it necessary to ask for the project extension I, tell, I told you before in the beginning. And we also had some problems with the compressor we used to pump the, um, the blend in the, uh, in the platform. A uh, failure that has been completely reported in the Helen platform. Also a challenge is the, that related to RSC hydrogen strategies. Uh, as you know, hydrogen is a quite, really dynamic process. It is difficult to get. We have to report according to several deadlines, uh, the, the state of art, the regulation, and so on. But it is so uh, fastly changing that it's difficult to get a temporal uh, report. Anyway, we are working on this. And thanks to our extension, we will be able to, uh, for sure, to get um, really good reports on the topic. Regarding our exploitation plan, we have six key exploitable results or cares identified in our project. We have asked for help to the Horizon Results Booster Module C, which are assisting us developing and completing uh, the description of these key cares. And thanks to their, uh, to their help, we will be able to develop a business model, at least for one of them, in 2023. We hold several exploitation webinars during the project, and the following one, uh, which is taking place in December, uh, in this one we are going to involve the advisory board, uh, so that it can uh, be uh, the exploitation can be close to the real needs from gas operators, manufacturers, and so on. The expected impact shown in the table on the right is really different according to the key year. This is because of the different nature of, of, of each of them. Uh, we have a target group from policymakers to business partners, so uh, different because we deal with different aspects uh, in the project. And finally, our dissemination activities. Uh, Higgs has been widely disseminated in these uh, two years, nearly three. We have attended more than 30 conferences, workshops, and events. We can highlight the Egerit conference, which uh, took place last year, which has a whole uh, day dedicated to, to the project, to Higgs. We 
also publish periodically our public deliverables on the website. So far we have only two of them, uh, those of the state of art of the grid 2.3 and the baseline with the methodology for our techno-economic model 5.1. Uh, this is because the first part of the project is related to uh, the building of the platform, but from now on we are going to publish constantly public information. The first results will be openly public quite soon. And for next year we want to continue in the line. We are going to participate in more events, more workshops, and if you want to keep updated, uh, I, I advise you to follow our homepage and obviously our LinkedIn profile. That's all from my side. I stop boring you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Javier. I must say it was not boring at all. It was very <laughs> interesting to see the developments. Uh, and I would like to give the opportunity to the audience if we have any questions. Uh, on, on the project. that it is very difficult for you to obtain real information of the gas grid and the state of the gas grid because they are not willing to provide that information. But how to to your understanding how applicable are these results to, to the real grid? Because we know some grids are also very old. Have you taken into account, have you, I see the research, uh, the, the test station, and I guess those are brand new equipments. Have you used old ones? Have you um, tried to replicate as much as possible how the real grid is? And also, if you identify any weak spots or um, any countries that these results may be more applicable to, to others? Uh, I, I think it's a very broad question, but, but thank you. No, that's a, that's a really good question indeed. Um, the thing is our first approach was uh, getting in contact directly to the main TSO in, in Europe and ask, the, uh, ask their, them uh, what do you have installed in job create? Um, it was difficult, we got some countries better covered than others, but what we have done is uh, compare the results we get, the information we get with public reports that are available. Uh, for example, about incidents in the grid, you have some of them, and so publicly uh, report things, Marco Graf, so this, this kind of reports. So I think that our results are ex uh, extrapolable, okay? There are countries which has a certain state quality, because it's entry point in the system, uh, higher quality than others, but in the end, uh, we, want, we have a wide map. Um, uh, because of trying to make uh, our result as universal as possible, we have focus on new materials, because um, if we use materials that have been in service, maybe the results are only uh, useful for this specific grid. So we have to be careful about this. And the object of Higgs is trying to get a picture of the whole continent. So this is why we have followed this approach so that then a gas operator can take the result and consider what more is missing. This is also why we get in contact with the advisory board constantly to see how do you find this, what do you miss, and what do you advise. Perfect. We have another question from Rosa. Oh, I can't. <laughs> <A> comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, regarding actually the question, and as NSOG, European Network of Transmission System Operators of Gas, I do have to comment. So, I would say um, it's not willingness, because the willingness is there. I think we have to find new ways of corroborating. I think I was in touch with Vanessa, as you know, a lot of times we gave you the floor several times in our working group to present your work, to ask for questions. And it's not the lack of willingness, I think that word is badly chosen. Um, it's the lack of, first of all, resources. Some TSOs have amazing, great, big teams, and some others, especially uh, in the East Europe, unfortunately, uh, they don't have those big teams. So it's the same person doing everything. 
and it's very difficult for them to follow up on everything that is going on. So at NSOG, also we have a very small team, so when they say, how many people do you have in your team? It's like, one is me. So um, it's very difficult for us also to follow up on everything. And I think at the beginning when we received the question, and you may remember um, 2020 when I came here to Brussels, it just blew up their minds to see how many details you were asking. And I wish we had all the answers to that as, as NSOC, and we could give them like um, available, but we, we don't have that kind of data, um, for sure, I can tell you. And there is this new way that we have to find to cooperate, how to involve more TSOs, but also DSOs, how to make sure that we are reaching out to them, because once, I think the second time that you presented in our group at ENSO, there were still TSOs asking, oh, but how long has this project been going on? And you already have been going on for one year and a half. Mm -hmm. So, and this is one of the comments, maybe we, we also have to reach out to, to more people and engage more externally. But I hope that in the future, now that you are running into 2023, and hopefully in the second part, I think it will come next year, um, or on in another call, that we can find a better way to collaborate that is not only reliant on one specific person from one TSO, but more broadly on that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I know it's challenging, and we are asking for a lot, because we want to give a lot <laughs> to, to the community. And for sure, we will find some way of uh, reinforcing this collaboration. Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions at this point? I don't see anything on Slido yet, but we might have, uh, yeah, towards the end of the session as they accumulate. There is a, there is a small delay as they come in. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank you very much, Javier, for the presentation. And uh, yeah, we can move on. Okay, with thank you. The, thank you. Yes, uh, and I heard in the presentation we had a failure in the compression uh, at, the, at the Project Higgs. So, yeah, one project dealing with compression is coming up. A series of projects, actually, uh, the Cosmic series. Uh, and we'll have uh, the coordinator joining us remotely. Uh, Rami Charuri, are you with us? Yes, hello, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Great. So yeah, I, I was actually planning to be there uh, in person, but unfortunately I had to, uh, to change plans at the last moment. So I'm very glad that I can be here, at least virtually, and present um, yeah, the two projects to you. Um, I understood the slides will be shared, right? Uh, yeah. Are the slides shared? Yeah, they're working on it as we speak. Perfect. Okay, then let's get started. Um, yeah, so uh, again, my name is Rami Shahruri and I work at uh, IFER and I am the project coordinator of Cosmic Demo, but I have the pleasure today to introduce you to, uh, to two different projects, so the Cosmic Excel project and the Cosmic Demo project. Next slide, please. So, um, the first of the two is Cosmic Excel, which is um, an answer to the call in 2018, which has to do with the improvement of innovative compression concepts um, with a focus on large-scale transport applications. Uh, the project is actually still ongoing. We're close to the end, um, so I'd say uh, we have a completion of about 90%. The total project budget is um, uh, 2.7 million euros, and the partners are IFER. Uh, which is responsible for the development of um, of a part of the innovative, um, oh, well, for the innovative compression technology, actually, uh, together with the French industrial company, MyTech, um, NEL, the HRS um, manufacturer, LBST, that's doing um, techno-economic analyses and market studies, and last but not least, Steinweiss, um, supporting the coordination and are responsible for communication, dissemination, and exploitation. Next slide, please. So then we have the Cosmic Demo project, which uh, was an answer to the call of 2019, and it started uh, last year in 2001. And uh, the purpose of this project is to take the innovative technology and really demonstrate it in a, in a full-scale commercial public HRS. Um, yeah, so as I said, it started last year. We are approximately halfway done with the project. The total budget is um, 3.7 million euros with a um, contribution from the CHP of 3 million euros. The partners are almost the same. 
uh, with the uh, addition of uh, CCTVI, which is a community of municipalities in Tours, uh, France, and they are the, the demonstration site owners and operators. And then we also have Efitec, which um, is a startup um, who are um, who are responsible for the manufacturing and the commercialization of the um, of the technology. Next slide, please. Yeah, so in fact, um, Cosmic Excel and Demo are part of a trilogy of, um, of projects, starting with the Cosmic project, which, uh, which uh, to give you a bit of context, I'll, I'll start with. So the Cosmic project started um, in 2017, and it's already finished now. And this is the first time, actually, that this concept of a hybrid uh, compression solution made up of an innovative metal hydride compressor in tandem with a mechanical compressor uh, was uh, conceptualized and, uh, and realized um, as part of the project um, a prototype, a full-scale prototype was actually uh, designed, um, manufactured and demonstrated in, um, in uh, protected, so in, in lab conditions. Uh, just to give a very short description of what metal hydride compression actually is, so metal hydrides are materials which um, have the uh, ability to absorb hydrogen at uh, low temperatures and low pressures and to desorb hydrogen at, at higher temperatures and higher pressures. So basically the way it works, if you can imagine um, a, a fixed volume, a vessel uh, filled with metal hydride, so you can um, allow hydrogen to enter the vessel at a low pressure and uh, with active cooling keep it at a low temperature and these metal hydrides will start absorbing the hydrogen like a sponge until they are saturated. And then you can imagine closing the vessel and heating it up. And through the heating process, these metal hydrides are forced to uh, to expel, to, to desorb the, the hydrogen. And as we have a fixed volume, so um, this, um, this desorption of hydrogen causes the, the compression, which we use to, um, to well, compress the hydrogen in the end. So this is the concept and the, um, the, the technology that was developed in in Cosmic, um, uh, we shouldn't forget to mention that in parallel to the innovative compression, so the mechanical uh, compressor was also um, specifically um, further developed uh, in, in the frame of, of this project to, to increase uh, efficiency, to increase reliability and to lower noise emissions as well. So after the success of the Cosmic project, um, the Cosmic Excel project basically has the goal of scaling up the technology um, with a focus on uh, heavy duty mobility and uh, larger capacities, larger flow rates, as well as um, higher compression uh, ratios. Um, in the picture at the bottom there, you can see the, um, the, the current uh, prototype of the Cosmic Excel, uh, of the Co Cosmic Innovative uh, solution. So finally, coming to Cosmic Demo, this is where um, we are taking all of the learnings and the developments of the past two projects and we're finally moving into a real life public HRS. Um, this station will be uh, located in, in Tours, France, and it'll be the first time that, this, uh, that these two technologies, um, the innovative metal hydro compressor as well as the uh, strongly improved uh, mechanical compressor will be, will be demonstrated um, together in a in a in real settings. Next slide, please. So uh, to get into a bit more detail about Cosmic Excel, so um, the different uh, well, the objective, as I already mentioned, was to um, was to scale up the technology for for heavy duty applications. Um, so some of the some of the objectives were uh, were to have absolutely no critical raw materials, um, which is uh, a bit of a challenge uh, that we are very happy to have uh, successfully achieved. Because metal hydrides, if you look in the literature, um, the they many of them do include uh, rare earth materials, um, and so uh, it uh, it took quite a bit of research and testing and development and fine tuning to uh, really. Um, uh, create uh, a recipe for the metal hydride which does not have any raw materials as all, uh, at all. 
Um, in Cosmic X, we've also increased the, the, the ratio of compression uh, to start at almost atmospheric pressure, actually, which uh, allows us to, to really have a very high range of, of compression up to, up to 500 bar. And uh, it's only the last stage of compression then that's uh, taken over by the mechanical compression uh, compressor to reach 950 bar. Uh, through many different um, innovations and uh, improvements in the design, we've been able to uh, reduce energy consumption for the total um, for the total solution. Um, and uh, we are currently uh, also uh, demonstrating this in lab conditions for for uh, under real simulated conditions. Next slide, please. So, and yeah, uh, so Cosmic Demo, some of the uh, details of this project include um, real, uh, a real um, uh, demonstration on site in a real public HRS. So basically, this is the first time that hydrogen that has been compressed by the innovative compressor and then um, in the second step by the mechanical compressor will really be refueled into real vehicles. And this demonstration has to go on for at least one year. We are planning to go on for, for a bit longer than that. Um, the conditions, are, so the, um, the demonstration site is secured, um, of course, and there's already a secured fleet of different vehicles. So it's going to be, uh, it, the, the call called, then the call asked for at least 700 bar. We're going to have a dual pressure, 350 and 700 bar HRS, which will cater to a wide range of different vehicles. So from uh, passenger vehicles um, to, um, utility vehicles at 350 bar and as well uh, something that's already on site is uh, a heavy duty 700 bar vehicle um the capacity of the station will be 200 kilograms per day and one of the most important goals of this project is actually to uh, increase the trl of the technology from trl 5 to trl 7 and of course uh, throughout all this um we're going to have a very uh, close look at the hydrogen quality through different uh, hydrogen purity measurements in the beginning, middle and end of the project to ensure that um, the quality being delivered to the vehicles in the end is, um, is of sufficient quality and conform to the, uh, to the relevant standards. Next slide, please. So yeah, I already mentioned the uh, development of the metal hydride is one of the mm, most important research um, activities in all of the cosmic projects, and um, we're very happy that uh, we have um, we have uh, so starting with cosmic, where we already had rare earth three materials, we've been able to really um, improve on them, uh, fine tune them in cosmic Excel. We have. Um, Achieved, uh, so we have um, identified metal hydrides that are that are capable of really uh, taking over the whole range of compression from almost atmospheric to 500 bar, um, and uh, going further than just the recipe of the metal hydrides, we've also been able to find new ways to to really um, uh, increase the, their efficiency, their their um, their capacity. Uh, through post treatment, for example, and um, and also we've uh, we've managed to to reduce the um, the necessary uh, temperature for the desorption phase by 20 degrees, which uh, opens up the technology for for many different um, so for newer and broader ranges of weight heat sources, allowing us also to improve um, efficiency. Um, so we've already identified and uh, so this can be considered as 100 percent we have the metal hydride we have the recipes and uh, we've tested them and we're ready to implement them in cosmic data. next slide please so um the the increase of the tech, uh, technology readiness level of the, uh, of the solution is uh, also a major milestone that we have for um, for the Cosmic Demo project. It's actually one of the it's actually one of the main uh, main purposes of the project. So, as part of that, um, I already mentioned that we have a fixed uh, site, so the technology will be really taken onto the market. Um, it will be. Um, demonstrated in real use cases here you can see some of the different fleets uh, and and uh, vehicles that will be um, that will be uh, um, refueled 
and uh, not forget, of course, uh, as a new technology, um, it's uh, going on the European market. Uh, it needs to be CE certified, and um, this is a goal that we will be achieving within the scope of the Cosmic Demo project. So we're doing all of the different uh, steps and tasks and studies and uh, conformity declarations and so on necessary to, at the end of the project, have um, a product which which we can which which is uh, CE certified. Next slide, please. So I already mentioned the new partner in Cosmic Demo, which is the company Effitech, and this can also be considered as an achievement of uh, the whole series of, um, of Cosmic projects because um, it's actually a, a spin-off of IFER. So IFER is a, a research institute, and within IFER, this innovative technology was conceptualized, it was developed, we had a few um, first uh, prototypes, and uh, now it's time to really bring this, uh, this technology to the market. And for that, um, it goes beyond the scope of a research institute, and that's why the company Effitech was founded, um, which will be commercializing uh, and industrializing the solution. So Effitech was founded in 2019. It has um, headquarters in Strasbourg, France, and um, a production site in, in Hagenau. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, so Effitech likes to um, emphasize it's not a French company; it's really a European company. We have uh, they have um, uh, different uh, different nationalities on the from between the co-founders, so German, French, and Spanish. And uh, the team of Effitech yeah, includes uh, already ten uh, different engineers, technicians, um, and researchers. Uh, with the goal of manufacturing HD technologies, in particular the innovative compressor of which we've been talking. So, next slide, please. So, what are some of the risks and challenges that we had in the in the last few projects? So, I mean, um, I think these points have already been mentioned. Uh, one of them is uh, definitely resources. So um, the last few years have been difficult um, for for the industry uh, regarding uh, supply chain issues, of course, and uh, price increases and scarcity of some uh, raw materials. Uh, obviously, in our case, uh, uh, raw materials are are also quite uh, quite a significant part of what we do. Um, and as well, uh, strain on human resources. So um, uh, during the pandemic and uh, until today, we still do have um, regular uh, problems securing, um, yeah, uh, qualified uh, qualified uh, resources to to work on the projects. Um, something else that was also mentioned in in the previous uh, in the previous uh, presentation is uh, regulations. So bring a completely new technology to the market um, for the first time. Uh, yeah, sometimes you do uh, identify and discover some some specific regulations that maybe we're not taking into consideration or which might cause um, a bit of a longer process than, than one would have initially thought. Um, and well, you know, the the it's one thing to have a clear view of, um, of uh, general European uh, regulations and, and codes, but um, uh, as we know, when you start going into specific countries, each country would have additional um, additional requirements, maybe, and sometimes even regional uh, requirements that that could complicate things. So, um, yeah, this is something which uh, which is a very good uh, lesson learned also in the cosmic demo project where you know actually bring this to uh, a public and commercial um, application is allowing us to identify all the different things that we have to take into consideration um, so where do we stand currently uh, in the project and what are the next steps so um, for cosmic Excel as I mentioned we're towards the end wrapping up the tests and starting to create the different reports and evaluations um, of uh, the data that's been gathered and for the um, cosmic demo project so the construction work has already started and um, there will be the installation and commissioning of the public HRS uh, in the very near future with the start of the demonstration phase in um, 2023. So 
that's uh, I think the last slide. I didn't prepare a slide for dissemination um, over here. I want to take the opportunity to mention that we uh, work in all three projects with uh, with an advisory board made up of um, of OEMs, of uh, fleet um, operators, of regional uh, project developers, and so on. And that's uh, a very uh, a very effective way to really uh, give visibility to the project and also have it. Uh, uh, find new ways for exploitation, and uh, of course we're active on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and on the last slide, uh, of course you can also see the project website. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm ready for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rami, for the great presentation. Uh, and congratulations also on the spin-off. And, uh, and on the back of that, uh, I would like to just quickly check check with you uh, on, on what it, what are the plans with respect to how how you you plan to expand your your manufacturing capabilities of the spin-off as as we we expect to have a steep increase in the need of of hydrogen refueling stations in the future. And uh, do you think that you'll be in a position to to grab a significant piece of that that market? So, um, regarding grabbing a piece of that market, absolutely. So uh, we are um, we are uh, we are working on the C certification, which will be uh, ready uh, within the scope of Cosmic Demo already, and uh, um, that's uh, that's uh, with that will be will be ready for for uh, large scale um, exploitation and uh, and implementation throughout Europe. Um, and regarding the manufacturing uh, capabilities, so uh, Ethitech at the moment has a, a workshop uh, which is going to be expanded um, next year with a, with a capacity of approximately 10, uh, 10 uh, units per year. And um, there is a clear um, there's a clear path uh, with goals and milestones in the upcoming years. So uh, the opening of a or the yeah the the, the development and the opening of a factory uh, factory in the next couple of years, with the goal of um, increasing um, production to about 100 units per year in 2030. And all this is being done also by uh, you know already taking consideration from now in the in the design and um, in the design of the of the uh, product um, ways to to really automatize and industrialize the solution okay thank you uh, and we also have a question from Slido regarding the the energy efficiency of the compressor uh, technology I've developed in terms of kilowatt hours per kilogram uh, when we're going to 350 bars and, and to 700 bars. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's actually an excellent question. I should have uh, elaborated on it, uh, on it a bit more. So um, the, one, of the, one of the great advantages of the innovative compression technology is the use of waste heat. So um, in, in the case where we have uh, waste heat, and we're, we're talking about um, uh, sources which which are quite re readily available. So already between 80 and 150 degrees Celsius uh, is uh, enough for for our um, for our process. And uh, depending on the amount of waste heat available, uh, we can really achieve uh, extremely low, uh, almost uh, so almost no need for additional electrical um, electrical power. Um, whether uh, whether this waste heat is available or not, uh, we do still have um, very high uh, high efficiencies, and uh, the goal of the project in Cosmic Demo is actually to show to show already around um, four kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen um, as a maximum for um, for for the compression in in a worst case without uh, without significant waste heat. Okay. Thank you. And we have another question from Slido. Slido is certainly very active. Um, could you tell us a little bit about? Um, sorry, I lost it. No? Yeah, it's about the capex. Could you sh share us uh, share some information about the the status of the capex cost associated with your proposal? So this as well uh, definitely um, uh, depends on uh, on some um, yeah on on different factors. 
So I don't want to get into uh, specific numbers uh, right now. Um, uh, if um, if interested, uh, you can reach out to us, uh, and we'd be very happy to speak about that um, bilaterally. Understood. It's always worth to to try to get this. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I think we can also open to the audience here if there are any questions at this point. No, not not yet, at least. Okay, once again, thank you very much, Rami, for your... For your uh, thank you all. And now we can move uh, to the last presentation uh, in this uh, panel session, uh, one on underground storage in salt caverns. And we'll have uh, Maurice, Maurice Slichtenmeier, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, uh, presenting. Maurice, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And um, you were um, fully perfect with uh, pronouncing my name. Thanks. Um, my name uh, yeah, is Maurice Schlichtenmeier, and uh, I'm working um, um, on the Hipster project. Um, Um, yes, hipster is um, on the um, is, uh, stands for the uh, hydrogen pilot storage for large ecosystem replication, and uh, we are demonstrating the um, the storage of hydrogen in an underground salt cavern um, in central France. Uh, you can see it uh, on the on the left side. Um, it's uh, the small circle on the on the top. Um, the project is running from, um, started uh, in uh, early 2021 and uh, is, uh, will run for three years. And um, we will have, uh, um, using a, a, a cavern with a capacity of uh, up to 44 tons of hydrogen, but uh, we will probably start with a smaller number um, and uh, go for uh, three tons uh, in the beginning. Uh, we are a consortium of nine partners from uh, four European countries. Um, the consortium lead is uh, by uh, the company Storingy, who operates um, the storage um, on the site of Etre. And uh, myself, I am working for the company ESK. We are an engineering service provider um, yeah, from, from Germany. And um, we are uh, yeah, supporting uh, the, the engineering part, modeling, um, and um, yeah, we're active in, in uh, very, uh, lo lots of different work packages in this project. Um, the, um, the project um, is uh, focusing on uh, several topics. Um, the, uh, the demonstration of the um, underground storage is uh, certainly the, the most important one. Um, and we also uh, have um, regulation and safety aspects. Um, replication potential um, is, an, is, is, a, is a focus. And uh, techno uh, technical and economical assessments, um, the, um, um, the, the hydrogen purity uh, is, an, um, is a topic, uh, especially regarding uh, microbiological um, activities. Um, and we have a work package dedicated to communication as well. Um, the Hipster project is divided in, um, technically in, in two parts. We have a, um, a hydrogen production platform um, consisting of an electrolyzer of uh, one megawatt power and um, a, a dispensing unit um, to, um, to fill up uh, tube trailers and um, transport the hydrogen to where it is used. And we have um, the, the storage platform which, um, which uses an existing um, uh, salt cavern at the site of Etre in France. Uh, below you see a, um, an, an aerial view of the site. The, um, uh, the, the blue marked area is, um, is an existing natural gas storage site um, operated by Storingy. 
which is uh, very important uh, for us uh, to have that infrastructure um, nearby. Um, the green um, marked area is the actual EZ53 cavern platform. Um, this is um, yeah, a well that has been drilled um, several decades ago already and um, was used for um, yeah, various um, tests, uh, especially related to geomechanics. Um, and there is uh, also some uh, open space uh, available nearby, uh, for example, the one uh, marked in yellow. Um, there the electrolyzer uh, platform will be placed. And on the right-hand side you see uh, some, uh, um, some sketches uh, of uh, how the system, especially um, around the cavern, will look like. I will come to that uh, again later. Um, <coughs> The, um, the aims of this project, especially uh, um, looking at the, the underground part, is um, the, the demonstration of the technology um, and the feasibility. Um, and we are looking uh, especially to uh, safety of operations and uh, environmental and geological impact. And um, also the adaption of the equipment, um, because um, equipment like uh, piping completion materials, um, these are usually not ready for, uh, for hydrogen yet. Um, so that is, uh, or has been, one of the challenges in the project to, um, to get equipment that is uh, suitable for hydrogen. But um, I think we, um, we, we achieved that uh, right now. Um, and um, then we have the, the topic of the hydrogen side tightness of the salt cavity. Um, we, uh, we have to develop um, a, a process for proving that uh, the salt cavity is tight for hydrogen. And um, I will uh, show a bit more details about that later on. Um, and also we are um, covering the thermodynamic behavior of the hydrogen in the salt cavity. Um, we already have uh, some fairly good ideas of how the, um, the hydrogen should behave, but we need to, to validate that. Um, and this is um, also just possible with a, with, a, with a demonstration project like this. Um, on an interaction of the hydrogen in the salt cavity with um, the other media there, salt, uh, brine, uh, or um, yeah, whatever, um, is also one thing that we look at. Um, it is also it's, um, not, not trivial, and we're quite happy that we can investigate that in this project. Um, and uh, this results then in the, in the, in the uh, quality of the hydrogen that can be withdrawn from the storage facility. Here I brought you some uh, pictures of uh, where we are currently, um, yeah, what, what is the current status on site. As you can see, uh, the work um, is, uh, is, is ongoing. Uh, we already started with uh, some uh, groundwork and uh, building foundations and infrastructure, and um, yeah, then um, so we are uh, yeah uh, quite on track with that. And um, on the on the lower uh, right side, uh, you see uh, the, the the wellhead of the cavern um, as it looked uh, like before the project. Um, that was uh, the result of uh, several decades of uh, geomechanical testing. And um, that has been nicely cleaned now and is uh, ready for, uh, yeah, for, the, for the further adaptions of the, of the installations for hydrogen. Um, here you see a sketch uh, how the cavern uh, is looking like. Um, the, on the very left side, it's uh, the, the current installation. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a usual uh, salt cavern design. Um, the cavern is, uh, has always been uh, filled with brine and it has an, uh, an oil blanket. Uh, so um, yeah, just what you, what you, what you need for the, for the leaching process and for the, uh, for, for the tests that have been carried out already. Um, the inner tubing will be removed when, it's, um, uh, when the cavern is prepared for hydrogen and um, the final <coughs> completion that is, uh, will be used for the testing is shown in the middle. Um, there will be a new tubing be installed and some, uh, some safety installations and we will install uh, a central debrining string to be able to circulate brine in the cavern. And by this uh, we will um, 
we will, we will operate uh, the, the cavern in the, in, during these tests. So this is an, uh, a very uh, an important aspect of, um, of this, uh, this project that we are using the brine to, um, to simulate the pressure changes and we do that in a way that is a kind of realistic operation um, but also allows us to, um, to draw conclusions uh, more uh, from, the, from a scientific perspective. Um, and this, uh, this uh, allows to dramatically uh, cut the cost for such a project. Um, with a, a gas installation, it would be a much, much, much more, uh, yeah, much more effort would be required. Um, one non-trivial part of the project is um, proving the tightness of the cavern. And um, on the right side, um, I have uh, f a few sketches of uh, how this uh, will be carried out. We are doing uh, tests by um, by introducing uh, a gas buffer in the in the annulus of the cavern and um, recording the pressure evolution uh, in the annulus and the central string. And um, there are also considerations about uh, measuring the, um, the interface level. Um, this would also uh, give you some, uh, some, some information about the tightness. And this is done subsequently with, uh, first with nitrogen, which is the standard method for uh, natural gas storage caverns, and then with hydrogen, which would be uh, yeah, something, something new carried out in this project. We are doing this test at uh, four different uh, interface levels. One is on the, the very top. This is um, the, um, the yeah, it's a bit, bit difficult to read the number one uh, level. Um, this is uh, to, to show the, um, the tightness of the, of the upper part of the completion. Um, then we are doing it at uh, position number two, which is just above the, um, the, the uh, lower end of the tubing, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the casing shoe. No, of the, of the tubing. Um, this is uh, to, uh, to prove the, the tightness of the, of the tubing, of the string itself. Then we are um, testing the, um, the tightness of the, um, of the casings of the, of the seat. Um, and that is the part that is, uh, the, the, yeah, what, what is usually the standard method for natural gas storage. Um, and we are also, um, as the cavern has a very long chimney, uh, we want to do uh, one test at a, at a lower depth that would allow some, um, some conclusions on the interaction of the gas with, uh, uh, with the salt uh, surrounding in the chimney. Um, here you have a sketch of uh, how the, uh, the cyclic test operation will look like. Um, the cavern uh, I have already introduced and uh, we will start injecting uh, hydrogen with, uh, from, um, from, from a tube trailer. And uh, as I said, the, the pressure will be varied by the injection or cycling of brine. We have a complete brine system for that uh, installed on site. We also need a little uh, freshwater system for technical reasons, but that's not that important. And uh, after uh, conduction of the, of the cyclic test, we are planning to vent the hydrogen and um, this en enables us uh, to, um, to also test lower pressures that are not available uh, for uh, technically um, by the brine cycling method. Um, now, regarding the test cycle that uh, we want to apply, um, you see uh, the, the proposal for the test cycle on the right side. It consists of uh, a big number of uh, small-scale cycles, uh, which uh, are um, super, uh, super imposed for by uh, large-scale cycles. Um, in total, by this method, we will have uh, more than 100 small-scale cycles and um, some, uh, some standstill periods in between. Um, which is very useful for us uh, for, for the calibration of, um, um, of, of our models uh, later on. And, uh, and uh, at the end, we will also do some, um, some, some uh, full-scale cycles, as you can see, and uh, the um, withdrawal is uh, indicated by the, the, uh, the red end of this, um, um, of this uh, development. Um, Yes, this is of course uh, subject to some technical limitations um, and uh, yeah, we have defined the, the schedule accordingly. And um, this uh, has been developed uh, by uh, first looking at uh, potential ecosystems at which uh, the cavern could be operated, um, which uh, include um, yeah, storage of uh, hydrogen generated by wind or solar uh, or by grid supply and um, um, 
usage of hydrogen uh, for transport or heating. It included backup, backup storage, and by that we uh, created some different uh, operating scenarios, which are um, yeah, uh, used as an inspiration for, um, for this uh, cyclic tests. Um, we aim also at um, uh, validating um, geomechanical and thermodynamical models um, with the cyclic tests. Uh, we already started with um, investigating uh, these, these models. We did some cross-checks by the, um, of, the, of the different softwares uh, that we apply. This is the Lucas software by Boa Consulting, one of our project partners, and the Kafpool uh, software, which is coupled with the Flex 3D uh, software. Um, Kafpool is developed by ESK. Um, and we see already that uh, both uh, the results of both tools agree quite well with, the, with, with each other. Um, we did some uh, calibration um, of the models uh, on the historical geomechanical tests on the cavern, um, and we already uh, performed some of the um, exemplary calculations for the for the cyclic testing, um, which will be uh, compared with uh, with the uh, measurement data at the end. This is a prerequisite for um, for for the rollout of the technology, because no cavern will ever be realized without. Um, uh, with, without modeling them first. Uh, this is required for, uh, for storage design, for the approval process, and uh, also for the safe operation. Um, to summarize, um, the project is well on track and within the budget. Um, the approvals for the on-site work have been granted. Uh, the, star the work has already been started. And uh, the Cavern EZ53 is suited for the, the, the modeled need in this uh, area. We um, successfully cross-checked the, the models that uh, we have prepared. And um, what's also interesting for you, we have a project rec website online. And there are also some uh, podcasts, I think uh, three or four podcasts uh, available online. We, um, uh, a month ago, we held a workshop with uh, some stakeholders. And there will be another workshop probably in, uh, in November next year. Um, if you're interested in that, I would recommend uh, go to the uh, website and subscribe to the newsletter. Um, next steps, uh, part of what I uh, already outlined before, would, uh, for example, be uh, looking at the microbiological activity, um, yeah, looking at the safety and environmental impact. Um, upscaling of the modeling is uh, an important thing, um, and the assessment of the techno-economic techno repli replicability and the uh, roadmap developing. We are engaging with other potential uh, storage operators and partners because we want to, um, um, to replicate um, our technology on other sites and um, we have uh, actually committed to uh, find at least uh, three uh, replication uh, sites um, during the course of the project. Um, we also develop recommendations for uh, policy makers um, and of course we uh, publish our scientific results. So I hope that we will get some interesting for you later. Um, thanks for your attention. If you want to uh, hear, I've brought you the, the, um, the uh, project website, have a look there and uh, thanks for to uh, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership for funding this fantastic project. Thank you very much, Maurice, for the excellent presentation. Uh, and that's the beauty of hydrogen. We started with liquid, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, and now we're talking about geology. So it's really, really, yeah, big variety. Um, yeah, and I have a question for you. Uh, you I think you, you mentioned that you'll be testing the facility with brine, brine cycling, basically, to, to increase the pressure of hydrogen and decrease it. And do you see a future step? Uh, you mentioned that it was, there was a regulatory barrier preventing you from doing it since the beginning with full hydrogen. Uh, and uh, following this step, do you think it will be, you will have a subsequent phase where you will be going to fully hydrogen storage in the, in the cavern? Um, definitely, that is uh, what we would like to do, um, to uh, fill the cavern completely with, uh, with hydrogen and um, operate it in a pressure-driven mode, uh, connect it uh, well, with the, the electrolyzer and, um, and um, yeah, provide the, the storage service to the uh, to, to um, transport and uh, other consumers in the in the surrounding. Um, that would be part of a um, of, of a next phase of the project, and we hope that we will uh, be able to to realize that. Okay, Ex excellent. Thank you.
Are there any questions from, from the audience as well for this project? Yeah, we have. Well, full, full cycles from uh, maximum to minimum pressure. Um, it's um, it's not not that diff uh, not that easy to answer um, because um, there are some some technical uh, limitations um, um, regarding the, uh, the the pressure losses in the in the tubing and in the um, also uh, what what you design your above ground facilities for. Um, when looking at the current uh, natural gas storages, they are usually operated in a seasonal way. Um, yeah, fairly um, with uh, some with with uh, some some extra uh, fluctuations, but uh, they don't play that big a role. Um, so hydrogen storages will probably be operated a bit differently, um, but I don't really also I don't really see a necessity uh, to uh, to perform uh, a lot of um, full cycles per year. I think um, um, going to uh, to maybe uh, two or three full cycles uh, should not be a significant problem. Um, other, yeah, in, in, the, in the beginning we thought about, uh, well, why don't we do uh, daily cycles? Um, but um, that's, uh, I think, for, for a real big cavern would be a s substantial challenge. Um, and um, it's uh, a big cavern uh, has uh, thousands of tons of uh, hydrogen inside. Uh, why should we? Uh, there is no real need, uh, I, I think, for, for cycling this in that uh, that frequency, um, and in the room between, there is uh, this is uh, open yet. Um, we we I, I don't uh, know any also any any research about uh, uh, what um, yeah what would be the limitations there, but this is mainly a question of geomechanics. Um, And we have another question from Slido. Um, we saw that there are two trailers being used to inject the hydrogen into the cavern. Why uh, are you using that instead of a, a pipeline, a small pipeline being built? Um, yeah, that was uh, considered um, in the course of the project. But um, it was decided that it uh, would be better to, uh, to decouple um, these two platforms for the current project phase. Um, that offers uh, much more flexibility and also building a pipeline is uh, not such an easy task. Um, I mean in this case uh, the distance wouldn't be too big um, but it's um, yeah it's still um, you can uh, yeah it can can um, 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 delay the project and um, and it's not really necessary um, because uh, we want to do uh, the cycling um, that we can perfectly do with the brine system, um, and um, well, doing the cycling uh, with uh, with with an electrolyzer, it um, doesn't really make a difference uh, from the from for at least from a subsurface perspective. Okay, thank you very much once again for your presentation. Yeah, and as we are pressured by time, I would like to invite the rest of the panel to come back on stage so that we all uh, take, uh, take a seat. And we can have this uh, panel discussion that we, we saw earlier with, uh, with Nikos as a panel. So please uh, join us on stage. And we also have our two avatars. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I would like to also introduce uh, Rosa Puentes uh, is joining us from uh, the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Gas. Thank you very much, Rosa, for being with us. Um, as our external uh, 
scientists uh, to give us a bit of feedback with respect to the program, uh, with, with respect to uh, our priorities, uh, and if there is a need to adjust them. Uh, and hopefully this is going to be an open discussion together with the rest of you to see how we can, uh, we can, uh, yeah, how we can uh, adjust our program accordingly. I'd also would like to, to give you the floor if you have a few key points that you would like to share with us based on what you've heard. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for staying with us now that is almost lunch time. I'm already hungry so I will try to make it short. So the first thing, I am happy that I could attend the whole session because I learned a few things. Um, I saw a diversity of projects but what I'm not seeing is a diversity in the audience and I will take this opportunity because I'm Always, I have been always inspired by Mirella from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership and I know how much it works to have more women on the stage and more women in the audience. So I would really like to also give the heads up that sometimes we also need to talk to our colleagues, um, more younger women, uh, to invite them to learn because this is the future and some of us will leave the future but some others may not. So just to let you know that diversity is also part of this equation. And talking about diversity in another sense, I think that um, one of the things maybe we already commented in my intervention before is the need to find the synergies. So Higgs projects is definitely one that I wish um, um, we could have participated more actively, um, but it's not easy with everything that is going on to be part of all the projects that we as TSOs and as NSOC are invited to. So at least every month we have three or four um, proposals of projects where they would like TSOs to participate and all of them are important. But again, we need to find these synergies in, a no in new ways of collaborating. Um, and in this sense, there is also um, more important than ever, I would say, that we also, in the research sphere, we play more the communication and dissemination role. So I think for the past years, um, social media, LinkedIn, everything, we just check it out. Maybe some of you still um, read the Financial Times, but I don't think you, you might read it on paper. You might read it most likely on the internet. And as research, we still are maybe a little bit far away from making that uh, impact in the communication. And many people, I can assure you, that could be interested in what you are doing. They just don't know what is going on. And it's a pity that sometimes we are doing our best efforts and at the same time doing something that was already discovered three years ago. Another point um, also that I already mentioned but I would like to emphasize is the need to have the proper geographical coverage. Um, I think that um, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership and the FCH before did a lot and I think we saw it, if you check it out online, the Clean Hydrogen Monitor from Hydrogen Europe that was released a few days ago, you see that everything that was invested was not in vain, that we have advanced a lot, but you can also see where the money went and you can see that the Central Europe was mostly beneficiary from that and there are still many countries in the East Europe that do not have the knowledge and do not have the experience that in the Central Europe we have and me coming from Spain I can say that there are things that we still don't know that maybe in Germany or the Netherlands they were already discovered and we may say that we can transfer the know-how but I don't know if um, at some point maybe your, your parents or maybe your husband or wife has ever tell you, um, don't do that, you know, and you still did it because you need to learn from your own mistakes. Uh, so sometimes we really need this hands-on experience and we cannot read that from a 200 pages report, which usually, to be honest, we don't have time to read. Um, and maybe more particularly on the TSO side, and I think that could be um, maybe because I, I come from NSOG, but also maybe applicable for other parts of the value chain. So we are in the middle between production, storage, and end use, which means that we have very little um, decision-making power uh, to decide whether hydrogen will be blended 2%, 5%, 20%, or 100%. So we do try to keep all the options open, and we do try to keep technology neutrality so that innovation can really happen. But in this sense, we have seen that um, in order to, that we need to accelerate. We have been talking about what do we need, what do the policymakers need to do, what do Clean Hydrogen Partnership needs to fund, etc. cetera. Um, and now we have to move on to the how-to, how to implement what we already know in theory, in the report, in real life, 
how to make these funds more effective, how to make the policies real work. So we need to close the gap between this ambition and the operational reality, and we need to do it faster. And sometimes I believe that maybe some of them, or I, I think that some of the processes, reporting processes might take too long and we have little time to do the real actual work and maybe that's something for, for consideration in the future. Um, again, more collaboration between private and uh, public entities could be needed and maybe here also a question that we can tackle later is I realized or I got to, to, to know that some of the testing facilities that were funded a few years ago are no longer being used. I think we need to innovate these business models and if a test facility has fulfilled its purpose, its purpose during the funding time, it does not mean that it cannot serve other purposes in the future. So let's try to bring new innovation, new business model that maybe before we didn't think that we could um, do it, but now it's an urgency to really develop hydrogen if we really want to deliver on the climate goals and reduce um, the dependence on Russian. And Maybe another comment from our side would be um, we need to maybe sometimes at some point not having too many requirements. I know that it's very difficult to create a call for proposal and I think the work that is being done is um, amazing. But sometimes the life uh, changes so much. I think nobody was expecting a pandemic. Um, nobody, almost anybody was expecting a war. So when the program is defined one, two years ago and then applied or the fund for, for the call for proposal is launched um, two years afterwards, things have changed so much. So if we keep the requirements that we designed, we might be losing a lot of innovation and a lot of new ideas that may have emerged or even necessities. And then last but not least, I would also um, mention um, a, a topic that I really much enjoy, which is um, digitalization. I think that coming from a conservative business as the gas transportation business is, uh, we have a lot to do to develop what is the so-called smart gas grids. And I still um, see a lot of projects that tackle silos, individual parts of the value chain, and do not interact with each other. There is a lot to be done in terms of digitalization, in terms of smart metering, tracking, and these little transversal projects can make the difference in terms of um, reducing risks in terms of increasing efficiency, productivity. So maybe just some food for thought. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rosa. Indeed, uh, your input is uh, very much welcomed. We are taking note. <laughs> and uh, I would like to, to shift a bit uh, the discussion and try to, to uh, maybe provoke you guys a little bit because we, <laughs> have a, we have two of you uh, working on, on, on pipelines, on the pipeline side. And uh, in our program, we have uh, two key priorities on that. One is repurposing fully to 100% H2. The other is on, on blending and mitigating the effects. Uh, do you see uh, any difference in terms of priority from your side? Should we focus more on, on one than the other? Do you think we should do both in parallel because we have a limited amount of funding and we have to somehow prioritized. Um, shall we start with you, Javier? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a, a really good question and a complicated question <laughs> because there is a lot of debate uh, around it. Um, I don't think blending and pure hydrogen transport are incompatible. And in the end, um, it is a question of the amount of hydrogen produced, which is available the quality of this hydrogen and the amount we have. Uh, this is going to give in the end if we go towards plant or towards uh, pure hydrogen. But uh, thinking long term, uh, it's a uh, pure hydrogen transport which we have to think of. Um, if we have to choose, uh, if we um, assess our infrastructure to pure hydrogen, in, in pipelines at least. Uh, in case of blend, we are working with a lower partial pressure. So if we can certify a, a vintage pipe towards 100% hydrogen, it should work without problems for, for blending. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think if we have to choose better 100% uh, thinking in long term <laughs> and thinking on technical aspects. Okay, thank you, Javier. And 
Rosa, from, <laughs> from your side? Um, I, I fully agree with Javier, actually. I think if we look at the long term, we are seeing repurposing 100%, right? 100% um, theoretically. Um, but it's true that both pathways seem to be coexisting, right, in some countries um, or some local regions. So as much as we can prepare for the future, it would be a pity uh, to miss the opportunity to prepare for the future because we are just focused on one side. But the fundings are, as you said, um, limited, so we really need to focus on what is needed. And here maybe the question is, as I said before, um, as TSOs, we do not make the decision. It's more the market making the decision, and especially the customers. So what do the customers need? What are they going to buy? And this is what we will transport. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Point taken. Um, yeah, and maybe switching to, to another uh, to another side, to the storage part, uh, Maurice, in our program, again, I'll present you with a, with a binary uh, approach. We have the, on one side, salt caverns as a possibility, which is a bit more advanced. Uh, we've seen demonstrations already. And then we have uh, porous media as an option with aquifers and uh, depleted gas fields. Um, do you see the need now to focus more on the porous media and uh, uh, as, as we've seen that it's a bit lower in TRL or do you still, st still see room for us to, to do more research on, the, on, the, on salt caverns? Um, I think, um, in fact, we need, uh, we need both um, because as you mentioned, um, the porous rock storage is lower in TRL and there are uh, definitely the more substantial uh, research questions. But um, we are not um, not, not uh, done yet with uh, with, uh, with the cavern storages. Um, in in the end of the hipster project, uh, we hope that we will uh, reach a TRL of uh, of seven. Um, but I think we uh, what we need is um, um, more operational experience. Uh, we will have after the hipster uh, project, uh, we will have that cyclic test with uh, which which will last uh, for uh, three to four months. And um, that should be uh, should be extended. Um, so we, we need some yeah some more operational time to um, to gain uh, uh, security about um, the, the scientific results um, and also to create a trust uh, by the um, yeah by the by the um, other um, applicants um, uh, who yeah other operators who should uh, replicate that technology. They will look uh, at uh, how long have you operated uh, that uh, the facility successfully. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, that is still an option, and we uh, we are not sure yet uh, what we will see on the microbiological side. Um, so uh, we, we definitely need some um, yeah need first to see some some results um, before we can decide um, yeah there about um, ch potential changes. Uh, in the yeah, and also in terms of the hydrogen quality upon recovery, right? Do you? Uh, what are your expectations with respect to the, to to this? Uh, what do you expect to find? Um, we will. <laughs> we expect um, to be uh, the hydrogen to be. Um, yeah, have a high water saturation uh, when when being withdrawn. That would be. Uh, that's what we usually see from the natural gas storages, and uh, that should also happen with hydrogen. Um, uh, depending on the on, on the operation um, with. Uh, yeah, it can also be that uh, specific uh, operation modes, which are probably more, uh, more, yeah, more frequent uh, in hydrogen, uh, that uh, the gas remains a bit cleaner. Um, that's, that's also an open question. Um, mm -hmm. And a part of that, um, we, um, we, yeah, we actually we don't expect uh, a lot of impurities, but um, from, now, from nowadays perspective, we can't be sure about that yet. Okay. Thank you very much, Maurice. Um, now to turn also to <laughs> the two of you that are joining us re remotely. Uh, Rami, uh, maybe you can uh, give us some feedback on, on, on what we need to do next with respect to, to compression. We've seen, uh, we've seen your, the developments. Uh, could you maybe provide us with some feedback on, on what are the next steps to take this technology further? Uh, what are the gaps? Absolutely. So um, 
the first thing I'd like to mention is uh, we've spoken uh, in the Cosmic series um, mainly about um, about uh, the, the mobility uh, sector. But I want to emphasize that indeed um, there are many other sectors and uh, industries that, that require hydrogen and of course uh, these compression technologies um, are suitable uh, are suitable to also different um, different uh, industries uh, due to their flexibility, their modularity and so on. So uh, actually also in the in the cosmic demo project in order to, to prove that as well, um, uh, as part of the hydrogen uh, station installation, we're going to be having uh, a filling center, which will be uh, operated uh, through the, the mechanical compressor um, for uh, for the foreseeable future. It's uh, foreseen to have an electrolyzer on site. So um, basically um, expanding the use case from uh, so far uh, just mobility to, to different industries. And on that note, um, uh, at the new technology, uh, we've uh, we through through the scope of these different projects, we've really been able to to mature the technology, bring it to TRL seven, and then uh, what we need now is a bridge to um, to to more um, IA uh, projects, um, and I think that's something which. Uh, uh, the CHP and other programs are um, are uh, very helpful in so finding use cases in hydrogen valleys, for example, to really uh, integrate into in, into uh, different infrastructures, energy hubs, and so on, in order to really uh, valorize also, um, for example, the, the the point of waste heat. So um, really finding finding solutions where we can find the synergy between different technologies and uh, as such uh, really increase the uh, the total efficiency thank you very much rami and uh moving on to you constantin on 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 liquid organic hydrogen carriers we've seen uh the need to scale up on one hand and on the other hand we also see the need to do uh, more um to go back and improve the energy consumption of the process, improve, uh, reduce the, the, the precious materials that are used. Uh, on your side, within our program, what do you see as the, the most critical right now? Well, actually, we think that uh, both things are critical. <clears throat> of course, we need some improvements on uh, catalyst um, efficiency, especially the part of uh, dehydrogenation. So it's, uh, from the beginning, we knew that it's a more critical um, part. So we mostly focus on the on, on this task uh, actually, but at the same time um, we see that uh, scaling up uh, is also very important, and so we're trying to do uh, uh, by the end of the project. And especially um, we see that the, already the problem is a transition from laboratory scale to uh, more industrial um, scale. When we work with industrial partners, we see that uh, the air capitan is not. <coughs> designed to work with this uh, small amounts of samples, for example, special form. So we need to uh, do it quickly. Uh, scaling up um, here, of course, we talk not only about the um, form of the catalyst uh, or um, uh, mass uh, quantity. Also, we need to, to think about the repetibility and procedability, I mean, the cycling. Uh, we don't have um, a lot of experience yet. Uh, if you talk uh, about the molecules we choose in the project, Brazil to learn, on the uh, long term utilization, because uh, the uh, technology we use uh, needs uh, to be very, um, uh, very strict uh, thinking about the byproduct production uh, formation. So uh, we need to be more focused on this part of, if you talk about uh, scalability, of doing um, many, many cycles, uh, long-term uh, long uh, experiments. That's what I think. OK, th thank you very much, Constantine. Uh, and we are, yeah, we're, we don't want to eat into your uh, lunch break, so I think uh, this is a good point to, to stop the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to invite you all for, uh, to applaud the, the, the panelists that we've had for the great presentations. Thank you very much.
This concludes the session. <laughs> that was fast. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, very nice to meet you. A very nice business.